You're listening to the Southampton Delivery po- po- Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. <laughs> If you want to have guarantees, you have to buy a washing machine. Okay, with a stupid head in We don't lose a match, either we win or we learn. And today we learn. Abdacha, Hawkins! Shot at Gizabi! It's in field to Mare, 25 yards out. Lovely ball for Pella. Onside, 1-0! Blue foul shot! Like Bambi on ice. It would be very, very embarrassing to watch. And now, and now, now your, host, your host, Matt Markstone. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast and newsletter dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SOC fans, available right here on SouthamptonDelivery.com. My name is Matt Markstone. I am the host of the show. And no matter where you are, no matter how you may be listening, whether this is your first time or you've been here before, thanks for making the show part of your day. I hope that you enjoy it. And I hope that you enjoyed Christmas. Uh, hopefully there's a win over Boxing Day. We're recording this beforehand. Um, and if you didn't, um, I think you'll enjoy this episode. And uh, joining me to help bring in the guest and introduce the guest, Will Daw from Saints Archive. So Will, welcome aboard. And, and how was your, uh, well, I guess I'll just ask you, how are you? I'm fine. Um, like many people in Southampton, when well, obviously that it's been recorded, we've been found out we've been put in here for, which is like a, a Big old lockdown type scenario for, um, for the Hampshire area. So, um, yeah, less than thrilled, but it is what it is. But hey, it, you know, the archive and doing these podcast episodes is uh, keeping me going. So, uh, yeah, all good. All right. Well, um, if people are hearing your voice and if they've read the, the title of this episode, they obviously know this is a total recall episode. And um, I wanted you to, to be on the call because originally uh, we've set these up to do, you know, you myself and Leon all together to do these interviews. And um, I think it's happened now where you you missed one because uh, of illness. And I wanted just to get your kind of reaction because this week we have Dean Hammond on the show and he does some work with the club. Uh, you can listen to him on the Final Whistle podcast. He also does some stuff uh, with, with his fitness program and things like that. And we'll get into all of that with him. Um, but, you know, going back to his time with the club, when when you found out we were going to be talking to him, what uh, what kind of memories or what did that bring up for you in terms of uh, what you remember about him during his time at the club? It was well, I was excited to be better with getting him on board for uh, you know for Total Recall, um, particularly because he's a, a more recent sort of uh, former Saint uh, to have played for the club. One obviously that's still massively uh, involved with uh, the interviews that they do pre-match and after match with uh, Kenzie Benali on the. Dance on Facebook page. So, for that reason, it was good to have somebody more recent on board. But I, to be honest, when Dean signed for us, um, I didn't really know who he was back in 2008, 2009. Um, sort of like the, the Libra money that had been invested in the club, and uh, Alan Pardew had sort of uh, bought a couple of key players, and one notable one, obviously, Ricky Lambert, for a really reasonable price of £1 million. Pounds. Uh, which now seems an absolute bargain in the century. Um, but, you know, Dean sort of started to establish himself in the team and get a name for himself. And, you know, I mean, I didn't realise that until recently. Maybe I don't know what, where, where my head was, but if you think about it, he's only the second uh, Southampton captain uh, to hold silverware up at Wembley, you know, Wembley Stadium, so since the off to the 76 Cup final. So he only had two, uh, two captains do that. And, um, and Dean was one of them, so he's already sort of cemented himself into the history of the club quite well. Um, he, I mean, a great player uh, over the couple of seasons he played with us before moving on. Obviously, I think as we progressed from League One up to the Championship and then the Premier League, um, maybe obviously different coaching coming in as well. They all had their own ideas, and you know, Dean was fortunate enough to get as far as the Premier League, but with us, it, it didn't quite work out near the end. But no, he's got a passion for us and the club. He still works, you know, uh, um, from a, a media point of view, uh, as I said before, you know, doing the sort of pre-match stuff. Um, he's obviously done the podcast as well. I mean, he's done a few others as well. So he obviously likes talking to supporters and talking about the good old days. And, you know, and I, he, he established himself in the Saints team um, really well, I think. And, you know, I think it was between 2009 and 2013 he played for us 
11 goals, 130 appearances. Um, yeah, total legend. Um, I mean, he's, he's not going to be up in the same uh, levels as the Benali Latiz legends, but he's a, he's a club captain that lifted the trophy at Wembley Stadium. So, yeah, he should be. I mean, maybe one day it might be in a Hall of Fame, maybe for Saints. I don't know. Yeah, yeah well, that's a pretty good transition to what we're going to talk about next. And um, I, I just wanted to say, when we talked to Dean, we, we talked about his time at the club. We talked about his time uh, kind of moving on from Saints and, and what that what that struggle was like. And, you know, one, not to give too much away uh, as you listen, but one of my favorite things is, you know, he set the getting to the Premier League as his kind of as his kind of goal. And, and it's what you wanted to do as a, as a kid growing up is play in the top division. And then he got so close so many times to to getting to, to that and, and then never really got to win. And at least my understanding as we talk and you can you, you, you'll listen for yourselves as you go. But uh, maybe he never, never really got to enjoy it as much as, as he would have liked. But um, we talk about that and what that means and, and everything else. And then his uh, also his work um, afterwards with, with Dean Hammond Elite Fitness, which um, all the links, everything is, is in the show notes. And uh, if you follow him on Instagram, you'll get to see kind of um, a lot of the things he's doing. And um, he's still in really good shape. So I would uh, take him up on, on any offers he has there. But you mentioned a, a Hall of Fame and in the Saints Archive, you've, you guys have been uh, putting together kind of a Saints Hall of Fame. Uh, Maybe if people aren't on Facebook or they're, they, you know, gets lost in the, in the Twitter shuffle, uh, why don't you kind of fill us in on what's going on there? Yeah, certainly. So um, it's something that I came up with uh, a couple of meetings ago, a few, over the last two, three years in the existence of the archive. Originally, I wanted to propose an idea to the club about celebrating this history, either a museum or some kind. Well, I mean, they've already got the executive suite, uh, 885 uh, suite, which is, uh, you know, pays homage to some of the history of the club. But I wanted it to be more so fan, you know, more fan driven mm-hmm. and more fan exclusive, regardless of salaries that they're on, so everyone could enjoy it. I came up with the idea of uh, Hall of Fame, and I mentioned in a separate call to the Saints Foundation that we're looking at a fundraising activity, um, obviously, because the pandemic's caused them to A, spend more money to help the local community, but B, also uh, reduce the chances of increasing their funds to do that. So I came up with the idea of there's a long stretch of corridor that I believe runs past the bistro and a lot of the larger suites at St. Mary's and sort of said there's a bit of a blank wall there. But could you not like start introducing a Hall of Fame? So the first Hall of Fame, you could have, say, five players inducted in. You could have the living members or their families, depending on who's been inducted in, invited as guests. They'd sit at their table and people would pay money for like a black tie event or just a smart dress event to sit at these tables with, with the legends themselves or their families. Yeah, so you sit at these tables and then what they could do is, is they could have a chat, have a meal, each player will then go on up or former players to go up and uh, receive their award and then that same evening have their picture placed on the wall or unveiled in the, in the Hall of Fame and then they do this as a yearly event but maybe not five each time maybe the odd one or two, all supporter voted for. So maybe a panel uh, could choose the next, you know, potential inductees and then supporters could vote for via the website. And I've proposed that to them. And they're probably getting there and putting that, that thing in place. But what I thought better still is the Saints Archive itself could run its own one to, to really get the juices flowing, shall I say. Yeah. Uh, really get that idea kind of prove that there is a hunger for the, the Hall of Fame and I've got to admit this, what we've introduced has been I believe quite a success um, for anyone that's obviously doesn't use Facebook you could find the five inductees plus one special and that the, which if I'd left out I would have been I would have had to move out of Southampton <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if they, they go to saintsarchive.com uh, the top five are in there so I'm going to chuck a few spoilers in there but you can I mean, you can jump on the website anyway and so you've got the likes of Matthew Matizia, um, you've got Mick Shannon, you've got Ron Davies, you've got Terry Payne, who's obviously club president at the moment. Uh, more, one more recent, uh, obviously, the great Ricky Lambert. And uh, Ted Bates, uh, being the special uh, inductee, totally could not leave him out. Um, I mean, he was everything from the player to the coach to the manager, chief executive, director, vice president, then president, Mr. Southampton himself. And the only person to have a statue, obviously, at St. Mary's, so really couldn't leave them out but i just wanted saints fans to start thinking about it and chucking their own ideas and admittedly there's a few that had to get 
left out. So if the clubs do want to know what it's like to run a Hall of Fame and what sort of feedback you get when you leave people out, I'm more than happy to chat to them. But <laughs> as I said, it's, it's just to get juices flowing, get the conversation going, prove that there is a popularity in doing something like this. And, and if, you know, the Saints Foundation in particular can run with it and, you know, uh, hopefully when we can all return back to some sense of normality, enjoy an evening with these sort of uh, individuals and maybe their families as well to pay homage to them. Um, I think it'd be great, you know, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, well, you get a chance to, to pay homage to, to the players and, and, their, and their contributions to the, to the club and the city. Um, and the fans get the, a chance to kind of join in. And then also, you know, the Saints Foundation uh, could always use that, that money that, they, that gets injected back into the community uh, kind of all around Southampton. So I think everybody wins there. And um, yeah, people should head over to saintsarchive.com. Uh, check that out. Or, or if you're a member of the Facebook community, group just uh go ahead and, and and look up what's what's going on there and uh yeah uh, i i know what it's like when you forget to talk about a moment in a match uh so i can't imagine what it's like to leave out uh people who who uh obviously everybody has their favorites and people they think should be in there so um there's always next year vote for them next year um and, and that'll be great so um but but yeah i just wanted to say uh to you will to thank you for for all of your help so far with this uh the total recall episodes have been a blast we'll be recording a couple of others uh, coming up soon. And um, yeah, I just want to say, uh, obviously Christmas hasn't happened yet as we talk, but at, at, at when this happens, it'll already have passed. So I hope, hope your Christmas was, uh, w- it goes all right. And um, yeah, I, I say now we, we jump forward uh, to Leon and I talking to Dean Hammond and um, yeah, here we go. So we'd like to give a very special uh, total recall. Welcome to former Saints captain, Dean Hammond. I'm joined this week by Dean of Dean Hammond Elite Fitness and also Leon from the Saints Archive. Unfortunately, Will could not make this uh, this recording, even though he's very excited about it. Uh, the weather has gotten to him, and uh, we'll just leave it at that. But um, welcome to the show, Dean and, and Leon. Thank you very hey, much. Very nice. Sorry, Leon. Very nice to meet you both. Yeah. Hi, hi uh, Dean. Hi, Matt. Um, it's good to, to meet up with Dean. Um, obviously, seen him play quite a few times um so it's, it's good to match, actually talk to him in person now yeah so sorry that's my first issue of, uh, of bad hosting there i introduce you both at the same time and then just pause awkwardly while you try, both try to decide who to talk so I'll, I'll clean that up as we go but very excited to have you on uh dean and, and leon nice to see you again dean you got a lot of stuff going on now you are both uh a, an analyst for i don't know if you would call it an analyst for uh, the final whistle podcast so you're watching saints uh, you run Dean Hammond Elite Fitness. You have your own family. You're also still working at Leicester City. So you are a busy man and we appreciate your time. Um, but we'll, we'll get into Dean Hammond Elite Fitness and, and things like that as we go. But we kind of want to walk through kind of your your career, but also kind of I'm interested in kind of some of the stuff that, that got you to where you are now. Um, so we'll just kind of start with, you know, can you tell me from an early age, were you involved in sport or were, was it just football? Were there other things that you were doing as, as, a, as a child or and did your parents push you into that? Just kind of give me a, a rundown of what your life was like growing up around, around sport. Um, well, it was very much involved <clears throat> around sport with my parents. Um, uh, they were both uh, very much interested in sport, um, enjoyed playing it, um, not at any professional level, just, just locally, um, just loved the um, sport and they passed it on to, to me and my sister. Um, was involved in football at a very young age. As soon as I could kick the ball, that's what all I'd want to do. Um, but yeah, definitely played other sports. Played, um, I, I swam a lot. Um, I was very interested in, in tennis. Um, but football was my main interest. Football was my my passion. I loved doing that. Um, like I said, my parents loved football as well. So I kind of pushed into that direction um, or encouraged into that direction. Um, but I loved it as well. And only to a point of probably about 11 years old. Um, I was playing a lot of tennis and football, and I had to make a decision at the time um, what route I was going to go. So I was quite handy at tennis as well, which I enjoyed. Um, but there wasn't really a decision to make. But I loved football, and um, that, that was the route I wanted to go. And I was um, ambitious, and I wanted to become a professional football if I possibly could. And, and when did that kind of realization come about, the, the idea that, hey, I want to make a go of this, and then was it, uh, was there ever a doubt that you were going to be, you know, were you always kind of better than the people around you? Or was it uh, one of these things where you had to work really hard to just kind of just be on par and and things like that? 
It's a really interesting question. I'd never had any doubt because I didn't. I just wanted to be a professional footballer, and I was gonna. I was determined to make it. Now I knew that was going to take a lot of hard work. Um, I'm from a small town in Sussex um, called Hastings, which you know there's only been three or four professional footballers have come from the area. Um, so I knew it was going to be a tough challenge, um, but I was always one of the best players within my area. Um, and anyone that I came up against that I thought was better than me or was a challenge, I would go away and improve myself. I always had that mentality that um, I wanted to improve and become better. Um, and a kind of a blessing, except for sport, I wasn't really talented at anything else. So there wasn't really another choice to go down. If I wanted to be a professional footballer, I wanted to be successful in life that I saw at that time. That was my only route. And... Um, that was kind of a blessing in the end, really. So I just put all my energy and all my focus in playing football. And so when you when you take all of that into consideration, and you know you're working that hard, what was the support like from your parents? Were they kind of encouraging? Did they have to kind of were they out working with you in the yard, or were they taking you to to lessons? What was the I guess the interaction or the um, the help from them? I guess my parents were fantastic, really, really good. Um, they supported me all the way. And they would drive me to training, they would drive me to matches, they would give up their weekends, they would give up their evenings after work. My dad would try and leave work early to come home to get me to training. Um, so they were really, really supportive. Difficult for my sister because, you know, weekends were made up of me playing football and she either had to come or she was, you know, she would go to a friend's house or family. So difficult for her and probably difficult for my parents to make that decision and a bit of a gamble, really. Um, but I would very much train on my own as well. I was very good at going out into the garden, going out into the street. Didn't have a, a huge garden, but I would go out, kick the ball against the wall, kick the ball inside. I was always with a football because I knew I needed to practice. And if I wanted to get to the elite level of professional football, you know, I, I knew I needed to practice more than others. Um, but I enjoyed it as well. It was, it was easy for me because it was fun and I really loved doing it. Um, so I think I was just destined to I was willing to put the hard work in as well. All right, and, and around Hastings, a lot of a lot of kickabouts in the street with other other kids, or mostly working with by yourself against a wall. Both, both really. I lived in a bit of a close, um, so there's ten houses in my close, but and there was probably three or four children within the close. We'd go out in the uh, out in the street and kick the ball around. You know, the neighbours probably didn't enjoy it because we kick the ball against cars and into their garden. But that was the the fun of it. But I would go out on my own as well. I'd be kicking the ball against the wall any time I had the opportunity to practice, I did. And it was more the one now where my parents had to try and stop me to have a rest, really. So um, I just loved it. I, I just loved it. I got the bug. I was hooked. I was addicted to it. Um, and I just loved it. And, you know, there wasn't, when I was younger, there wasn't, we didn't have a computer. There wasn't as many live matches on TV to, to distract you. It was just you and your football and your friends. So... I think that unfortunately that's a little bit missed nowadays, um, but that's the reality of life. Absolutely, um, I, I can say that uh, our pastime here in the United States, when I was out playing baseball, my neighbors definitely didn't appreciate that because those those balls don't bounce off the uh, off the cars as much as they just go through the window. So, um, you know, it, it is what it is, and I, I'm sure the the neighbors now look around and go like, "Oh, like he made it," because I made it to college, and then that, that was it. And so the, <laughs> there's no payoff for for the neighbors having to put up with me. So, so Dean, based on, on that, you, you obviously grew up in Hastings. Uh, Leon, why don't you walk us through getting, getting Dean into his time at Southampton, which is something that uh, you know, listeners will truly appreciate hearing. Yeah, let's we'll, we'll, we'll talk about your career now. Um, Dean, uh, and as you said, you were born in Hastings uh, back in 1983, and your first professional club um, was Brighton, and you, you hang around there for about eight years, I believe, Dean. And then um, you moved on from the Seagulls and, and you spent a short spell with Colchester. And then you moved on to, um, you made your best signing ever when you signed for Southampton in 2009. Um, so at the time, there was um, Dean Wilkins, one of your, was your former manager at Brighton. He was the assistant manager to Alan Pardew at the time, wasn't he? So um, what, what did, was Dean... Um, one of the reasons of joining Southampton? Uh, he was definitely one of the reasons. Uh, he was the first contact I had about the, the move. Um, I spoke to him and, and knew of the interest. Um, but you're right, I worked with Dino. He was my youth team manager at Brighton and then also my first team manager at Brighton as well. Um, so I knew him very well, still friends with him now. 
Um, he's an excellent coach. Um, and as soon as we spoke and, and discussed the move, um, and obviously a, a club like Southampton, when they come calling and are interested in signing for you, there's not much of a decision to, to be made, to be honest, because um, they were very ambitious. Um, they wanted to obviously get back up into the Premier League, and it was my opportunity. I felt as though as a player that if I was going to get to the Premier League, this was my chance. So as soon as I knew of the interest, um, as soon as I knew obviously Dean Wilkins was there, and Alan Pardew was there, and the new owners were in, it was something that I wanted to happen, um, and I was very keen for it to happen. So I made my agent very aware of that. I was actually very happy at Colchester at the time, um, but when Southampton come calling, there's, there's not a decision to make, really, and it was the best decision I made in my career. Yeah, that was a, the start of, the, of big things at the club at the time, wasn't it? Um, so you, you had three fantastic years at Southampton, Dean. You had two successive uh, promotions, and, and then you topped up the Johnston Paint Trophy in 2010. Um, and, and in that time, you, you were the captain most of the time, wasn't you? And, and what did it feel like to be the captain in this period? You, you, know, you must be very proud of it. Very, very proud. You know, when I first came in, obviously, Calvin Davis was, was club captain. Um, and Alan Pardew just felt as though he needed um, an outfield player to be captain, to be, to be team captain on the pitch, to help influence the players, to encourage the players, to, to influence the referees. So to be made captain of Southampton Football Club was, you know, one of the biggest um, achievements of my career. I was very, very proud. I love wearing the armband. I love leading the team out. Um, I love playing for the club. So... Fantastic memories, um, and to be captain um, and lift the trophy at Wembley with Kelvin, um, to have back-to-back -back promotions and getting the club back to where it, it should have been or it should be because it's a huge football club, um, I'm very, very proud of that, and um, I look back with such fond memories. So being captain, I think, actually made me a better player. I love the responsibility. Um, I love leading the team, especially on match days, leading by example. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for for Alan making me captain and, and Nigel continued, continued to keep me captain uh, when he came in as manager. What's it at the time, Dean? Um, to me, you seemed quite a calm uh, sort of captain, really. Didn't, I did see you go sort of round rolling the players if they made a mistake on the pitch or anything like that. You seemed sort of very calm with everything. Is that true? Uh, I'm sure I had my moments, I would suggest. <laughs> but um, yeah, I tried to stay calm. I think that was encouraged by the managers. I think. As a, as a captain, you have to keep a level head. You're, I saw as a captain that you lead by example. So I tried to, you know, I would always try and train as hard as I could. I would always try and put the best performance in I could. If something needed to be said or done, I would put myself first. So, you know, there was moments where players needed a, a rocket up their ass potentially, and that would come from a manager or myself sometimes. Um, but I think if you encourage others and you stay positive and you, um, you talk to people and you explain things, I think that message can come across um, just as effectively as, as shouting and swearing. So um, I definitely try to find the balance, um, but yeah, I try to remain calm as possible. Well. But we were winning a lot of games, so it was quite easy, if I'm honest. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned Calvin Davis just now. Um, he, he was the club captain and you, you were the team captain. And um, at the helm at, at the time, we had the, um, obviously the owner, Marcus Lieber, and um, Nicola Cortese. Did you have any conversations with Marcus or Nicola Cortese about where the club's going to go at that time or, and its ambitions? When I first signed for the club, I, I met Nicola and he explained the ambitions of the club. It was part of, it happens with every new signing. They explain the direction, the the journey, the plan that they've got as a football club to try and get back in the Premier League. When I, when I first signed, it was told to me that we would try and get to the Premier League in five years. Now, you know, realistically as a player, can you stay at the club within five years? I was hoping I could. We did it in three years, so it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, I met um, Marcus a couple of times. Um, one time at Wembley when uh, obviously we lifted the trophy. I met him a couple of times at the training ground and uh, the stadium. Really nice man. Really lovely family. Um, so the, the, the club was very fortunate. They were in the right hands. Um, Nicola was a um, very determined, ambitious person. And, um, you know, he ruffled a few feathers, um, but really, really good for the football club. And he was the person that, that set the tone, really. And it kind of drifted down through the football club. So brilliant people. Um, the club were very fortunate to have them. Um, and it just, it just all clicked. And 
Um, you know, you meet people like that that are ambitious but nice and genuine. Um, the club's only gone one way, and that's what happened. For part of your time at Saints, uh, Nigel Atkins was was the manager for most of the time that you were there. Um, he himself, and, and I've explained to you this to you before we started recording. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't watching the team at the point where he was was in charge, but. Uh, the way that fans on social media, which is not always the kindest place, uh, address Nigel and, and his his ways and the calming presence that he seems to have. Um, how how did that work when you uh, you know when you were the captain under him? Did he have an impact on on your demeanor kind of now and the way that you approach your coaching and things like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, Nigel was very level headed. He was very calm in, in his approach. He was a, a deep thinker. Um, and he would he would analyse the game. He's an intelligent man, um, very different to Alan Pardew, very different to actually any manager I'd previously worked under. Um, he was very positive in his approach. He wanted the players to, to feel comfortable and to be the best they could. So, um, no, I enjoyed working under Nigel, and I think, yeah, a lot of the stuff that he did and the way he did it has rubbed off on me, um, not only within the football industry and the football profession, but as a person as well. So I've got a lot of respect for for Nigel, he showed a lot of faith in, in, in me personally and a lot of the other players. Um, so I'm very grateful. But no, a, a nice bloke. Um, Work with him again. Still speak to him on occasion. Um, so, yeah, no, he, I like, I'd like to see him back in football. I really would because I think he's an excellent manager with a lot to offer. So, no, a good guy. Um, when, you, when you talk about him that way, you know, we have managers in the Premier League who kind of are in your face. You think of, of Hassan Hull to an extent who kind of seems to have this, the, this is the way we're doing things and get in line or the train is leaving the station kind of kind of deal. Um, you have guys like Klopp who are very, uh, you know, over the top. Um, how does it, I think it's maybe a little bit more, um, it's easier to see how those guys gain control of a dressing room, but how does somebody like Nigel Atkins control the dressing room or, or gain the trust of the guys when he's not in there uh, yelling and, and going on tirades on a, on a kind of a frequent basis? Well, I think he proved himself by obviously us winning games. I think as a, as a player or an individual, you, you believe in things when you see success. Now, we was having a lot of success when Nigel came in, but not to start with, to be honest. When Nigel came in, we were in a difficult position. Uh, we weren't winning games in League One when we really should be running away with the division in the players we had. And he came in and he wanted to change the style we wanted to play. And he wanted to be more possession-based, play out from the back, and create more chances by uh, kind of keeping the ball on the floor. And that took a bit of time. So, you know, it could have gone the other way, to be honest. But the players bought into it. We started winning games. Um, but his messages were clear. That wasn't Nigel was very good at. His messages were clear. He didn't need to really shout and um, Kind of be that demanding because he just made it very very easy to understand what he wanted and he was he could be ruthless Nigel but ruthless in the fact that he would just make hard decisions if he needed to make a decision he would make it there was times when he left me out of the team and you know I wasn't obviously too happy but he would tell you that would be it that would be the decision and you had to get on with it and then it was down to you as an individual to get back in the team so you know he didn't have to be vocal and loud and aggressive he just made hard decisions when he needed to make it and uh, the players walked into it because we were winning a lot of football matches so um, I think we trust him. We have a couple of listener questions that uh, we can kind of insert here that they kind of go with what we're talking about. Um, this one comes from Matt Hill and he says at what point it says at what point during the championship promotion season did you and the other guys realize that promotion to the Premier League was possible and as captain what did you and Nigel Atkins and, and to an extent Kelvin Davis do to keep everybody grounded and focused in, in the job, even though you were kind of running away with things for, for a, a large portion of the time? Um, it's a good question. When did we, look, when we came back for pre-season, we'd just been promoted from League One into the championship. Um, and the message was from the manager and the owners that we were going to get promoted again. That was the message. This is what, we're Southampton Football Club. We should be in the Premier League. We want to get to the Premier League. We've got good players. But the ambition was to get promoted that year. And that was the message. And that was driven into us. And, I think when we beat Leeds at home 3-1 the first game, um, then I, th I think the next game we went to Barnsley and won, and then we went away to Ipswich and won. And I think the players then, without saying too much to each other, just thought, okay, you know, we're, we're comfortable at this level. We can, we can do well at this level. Yes, we're going to need to be consistent. We're going to score goals. But we had a really good team of, of good players. And 
it didn't really take much, to be honest, Matt, to kind of to keep us grounded. We were hungry, ambitious people that saw an opportunity to get to the Premier League. You know, not many of us were in the squad had played in the Premier League, and this was our chance. In football, if you get an opportunity, you have to take it. Um, and we saw that. And there were moments within the season where it was the other way. We had to kind of be over the top. We had to kind of keep us focused if we lost the game. I remember going to Brighton and losing, I think we lost 3-0 when Ricky Lambert got sent off. And um, we sat in the dressing room afterwards for about an hour, 45 minutes, going through everything. There was a few home truths, um, some, um, some words spoken, but it really helped us and we finished the season strong. So... Um, it wasn't too difficult because the group of players we had was fantastic and we knew we had real direction um, of what we were trying to achieve and that was to get to the Premier League. So just a really enjoyable place to be at. When, you, when you're in the championship or in your in league one and you're, you're playing and obviously the goal is to get promoted because it's, it's kind of your job and it's, it's what the, the club wants and it's obviously good for the club and it could be good for, for players as well. How, I mean, for you, you mentioned that not a lot of players had had Premier League experience at that point. How much of, uh, of it was, you know, this is, this is the chance to get to the Premier League as, a, as an individual? Did that, did that play into it for people? And, and does it matter, I guess? Or, or is it, um, if, if you see somebody out there who's definitely for themselves, do you have, is your job as captain to kind of refocus them on, on, the, on the team and on the club? It definitely would be if there was someone like that. But within the squad, we didn't have that. We, there was a lot of... There was a real mixture within the squad. You had a lot of younger players that were destined to play for the Premier League, to play for the country. Adam Lallana, Morgan Stardin, Joe De Fonte. I, I'm going to forget players. You know, sure. Alex Oxlade, Chamberlain, Ricky Lambert. You know, we had a fantastic players, and they probably knew they were going to get the opportunity to play in the Premier League on a regular basis. And then you had players potentially like myself, um, Danny Butterfield, uh, Fraser Richardson, um, Dan Harding, that probably knew this was going to be our one and only chance. Now, obviously, it wasn't. I went to Leicester and, and done it again. But at the time, you know, I was, I was, I think I was 27, 28 maybe at the time. And I thought, OK, I'm at Southampton Football Club. We're doing very well in the championship. There's no way in the world I'm going to let this slip again. No way. I'm, I've got my career goal was to play in the Premier League. I, like I said, I'm from Hastings. I started at Brighton and League 2 get to the Premier League seemed a million miles away, even if it was ever possible. And this was my chance. And that just, you know, the group knuckled down. We trained hard, really hard every day. Most days um, we were focused and, you know, we sacrificed a lot. I, I know I sacrificed a lot of my family um, because I knew this opportunity might not come around again. So um, it didn't take much of control because everyone was just heading in the same direction. When you gain promotion to the Premier League, I assume, and, and having listened to a, a recent interview that you did, um, disappointed not to carry on with Southampton. Um, but when that came about, it, how did that decision process go? Or how did the decision-making process go for you uh, and between you and the club and, and the decision to, to leave and, uh, and go and play elsewhere? And, and what did that, I guess, what did that feel like if your career ambition is to get to the Premier League and then it kind of, you know, you go through all of the steps and it doesn't happen. How do you, how do you deal with that? Well, to be honest, it was tough. I must admit, I'd, I'd, I'd come to Southampton. We were bottom of League One on minus 10 points and we, we got to the Premier League and I, I played a lot of games. I was captain and I felt as though, I felt as though I deserved the opportunity. But football and life doesn't work like that. You don't, you don't always get what you deserve. And, you know, I was a, a brilliant football. The reason I got to the Premier League was because of Southampton and the players I played with. Now, Southampton are not suddenly going to stop being ambitious then. They invested in more players. They brought players in, which made it harder um, and more competition for places. And if I'm honest, the club were really, really good with me. They were honest with me. The manager was honest saying, look, you're not going to be captain this year. You know, it went to Adam Lallana and, and but he spoke to me, didn't hide from that fact. Um, I wasn't involved in the first game against Man City. James Ward Prowse came into the team and started the game. So, you know, he was coming through and they wanted to push him and develop him. And I understood this. I maybe at the time didn't agree with it, but I understood it. And, and this is football. So it was difficult. Am I, would I have liked to have um, led Southampton out for the first game in the Premier League 100% as captain? That would have been the icing on the cake, but it didn't happen. And the club were really good with me. They helped me get a move to Brighton, which meant for my family, I could stay local. I could go back to a previous club. 
I could go and play for my hometown club again. So, you no, know, they did a lot for me. Um, but the manager, this is what I meant about Nigel, you know, he could be ruthless and make hard decisions. And he made a hard decision, Rob. We got on the same day at Man City, he pulled me aside and said, look, you're not going to be captain anymore and you're not going to be in the squad. So, you know, he's made a hard decision, but at least he told me to my face. So I respect him for that. Um, and then it was just, just a decision from there. Okay, what is my what is my next best move that I can potentially get to the Premier League again? So um, now I'm I'm gutted it didn't happen, but I I'm, I have, I've not got one word bad word to say against the football club. They really really. Well, I think honesty is is what is all you can hope for because the decisions have to be made, and we've seen uh, I think in in certain instances where you know people kind of either they go behind your back to do things or not you specifically, but you know, they're not, they're not up front. And that's, I think that's what causes a lot of the conflict. And um, your, your kind of story there about coming up all the way with the team and then not getting to participate in kind of the goal that was there um, reminds me a little bit uh, of, of, of fonts kind of run in the team, being captain for so long, getting to uh, the Europa league and then not getting an appearance. Um, I, I don't know if you stayed in contact with him or had any words for him at that point, but is that is that's kind of the same situation where you just hope that honesty was there and then and that Puel was up front with him and you know or is that uh, I mean is it do do you blame him if he's a, if, if he's upset by that or anything like that? No, because everyone's going to react differently and every manager is different as well. Not I mean I've worked with I won't name any names, but I've worked with different managers that are not honest with you and they're not up front with you and they will hide behind their decisions and hide behind players and, and different things and 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 that's life. That's not just football. Um, but that's why I do have so much respect for Nigel because he was up front with me. And, you know, Jose, like you, you've mentioned there, I, I don't know his relation he had with Puel. I don't know what that was like. And when a decision is made, everyone has their reasons. There's obviously reasons behind it. You're right, though, Matt. You would just like to know the reasons. You don't have to agree with them. You'd like to know. Um, and then you can make your own decisions from, from there. So who knows when, or what went on behind the scenes. Football is all about opinion. That's why everyone loves it. Everyone has a different opinion. I thought you played well this week. I think you didn't play well this week. It's just opinions. Yeah. Um, and you can't, as you get older, you understand that a little bit more. If I was younger at Southampton, it happened. I don't think I would have reacted so well. Um, I would have been a little bit more fiery. Um, but no, it's, um, managers have a really tough job. They, they really do. When you finish the game as a player, when I've been back into Leicester and I've worked back, you know, kind of on the coaching staff and different things, you see a different side to it. So it is difficult. Um, but at the time, I'm sure Jose would have been very disappointed. Um, and I'll just, I asked that question because he was honestly one of my favorite, my favorite players. But anyway, I, I never had a chance to kind of watch you uh, during your career. But Leon, you were, you were around in that St. Mary's in a season ticket holder for all those, all those years. Um, so can you kind of, uh, you got a couple of questions that uh, you want to address to, to Dean here. Yeah, I mean, uh, those are really horrible times then. We were, we were bottom of, of League One, we had minus 12 points or whatever it was. So there was this massive time we had to make to get back into the Premiership. And as um, Dean said just now, uh, Cortese had this five year plan. And amazingly, we've done it in, in three years, not five years. So that's just a fantastic achievement. But yeah, going back to watching me play um, Dean in, uh, in midfield. And I remember taking the young dad with me um, down to St. Mary's and um, to watch the game. I said, enjoy the game, my friend. But I said, if you want to learn anything about football, about how to play in midfield, just watch Dean all through the game. Um, and, and I learned, you know, from watching you, um, you seem to look up before you had the ball, um, to where the, all the other players were. So that when you did receive the ball, you knew exactly where you're going to put the ball. Um, and this is what I said to this young kid. I said, you could learn so much from Dean. Was this something um, you picked up, Dean, from an, an early age, or was this coached into you? It's a really good question, Leon, actually, because um, it's something that I would have learned from a young age in terms of awareness and, and, and looking off the ball um, before I received it. Um, and... The higher you go up, the higher level you play at, you need that as well because um, the speed of the game is a lot quicker and you need to move the ball quicker. But it was actually when Nigel Atkins came in um, and he was very diligent on this in training. He used to call it scanning. 
he'd want you to scan before you receive the ball. You know, look over your shoulder two or three times before you get the ball. Um, and he really drilled that into us in training. This is one of the changes he made. You know, sometimes we would play, we would train, and it would be silent football. You couldn't speak, you couldn't call for the ball. You needed to know where your players were on the pitch. And when he first introduced this, we thought he was crazy. You know, what you're doing, silent football, this is all about talking and communication. But he really helped us, and it really helped my game as a midfield player. You know, knowing where you're going to pass the ball before you receive it makes the game so much easier. Now, you can't always do that because the pass that comes to you, you may need a touch, you may have to move it. The player that you've looked may have moved. Um, so it's all about timing as well. Um, but, no, it was definitely... It was definitely improved in my game and developed in my game when I went to Southampton through Dean Wilkins, through Nigel Axe. So, um, again, being at a big football club like Southampton, working with um, top coaches, um, I was still improving as a player, I think, even at uh, the older age when I was getting older during my career. I'm going to pitch one of um, Matt's uh, questions now. <laughs> at that time, uh, there was a fantastic rise up into the, the Premier League. But uh, one player I wanted to talk to you about is um, Sir Ricky Lambert. What, what can you tell me about Ricky? Well, what do you want to know? I mean, he's a um, fantastic footballer. Um, he's a great guy as well. He's a, he's a, he's a good character. Um, but no, I mean, the goals he scored for the club and uh, the service he gives to the football club was amazing. And you think they I think they paid £1 million for him, which at the time for a League One player was a lot, a lot of money. That was a big investment by the football club. But obviously the career he went to have through the League One, the Championship, playing in the Premier League, going playing for England, going back to Liverpool, um, really, really money, a good money um, spent. Um, but one thing people probably don't appreciate about Ricky is that when he first signed for Southampton, he wasn't as fit as he could be, and he worked really, really hard. The fitness coach gave him a program, a fitness program that he would be he would be in the training. So Ricky, when he first came to the football club, he would be in the gym. He had to do a certain amount of um, Time on the bike and cardio work, then he would go and do some weight work, and then he would come and train. So he dedicated himself. Again, he would have known signing for Southampton, this was an opportunity to bring out the best Ricky Lambert he could be. So he had to take a little credit for that. Because it's one thing someone telling you to do it, but actually doing it and him doing it. You know, I used to go up to the gym as well, and I'd see him in there sweating before training, before breakfast, getting himself in the best condition he could. And this was in League One. He was learning good habits and good traits then. So, you now he deserves everything he got from his career because he's a brilliant footballer. And he could do everything, Ricky. You know, good footballer, score goals, could uh, assist with goals, um, held the ball out well, was a leader, was a voice in the dressing room as well. Um, so, no, he's an, he's an absolute legend at the football club. And um, I had the pleasure of playing with him and I had the pleasure of uh, having a few drinks with him as well, which was... <laughs> Kind of on that note, have you kept in contact with any of the guys that, that you played with at Southampton and or kind of, you know, as, as time goes on, you have a family now, uh, a growing family, a family that was larger than when, when you were at the club. You know, do you guys still stay in touch or is it kind of just like everything else where you have one or two kind of tangential connections or, or anything like that? Yeah, not massively in touch. I still speak to a few of the players here and there. There's a few things that sometimes go on at Southampton that we get together and um, see each other again, but probably not as much as we could, if I'm honest. But you know, we've all got family, we've all got kids, we've all got new careers. We all live in different areas of the country now, so you know, it's easy to stay in contact. So we we probably could do it more, um, but no, not that much, which is which is disappointing. But you know, it's when you do see each other again, it's good fun. It's really good fun. So um, no, good memories from it. Um, but like you say, life kind of just goes on. And you get um, sucked into your own, your own individual bubble, which especially with what's going on in the world. Yeah. Um, but no, it's um, good memories of that group of players because they were good players, but really good people as well, which is, which is nice. And I guess kind of along that same note, do you, do you check in on scores and stuff? Uh, you know, Lalonde is down at Brighton now. Um, other guys are kind of scattered all over the place. So when, when the, the box scores come out or a match of the day is on, do you kind of just check in to see how those guys are doing or is it, and, and if you don't want to answer that, you don't have to, because I won't. Uh, I can edit this out if you want. No, 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 of course. Yeah, I mean, any player that I play with or I've got an interest in, I always, I always check the scores, always see how they're done, whether they've played, if they've scored, if they've assisted, if they've got booked, then far. I'm, all, I'm always interested because they're still playing and I'm not, which is, you know, as a player, as a former player, you miss that. And, and they're still doing what I wish 
we could all continue doing, but obviously as you get older, you can't. Um, so yeah, I still take an interest, and I love to see the players that I play with doing well, playing in the Premier League, especially you know the older players that are, are still playing at such a high level. It's fantastic for them that you know the, the, the mentality they had when we were successful at Southampton. They must still have it, um, and they're still playing at such a good level. It's, it's great to see. So. Um, yeah, I was very fortunate to play with some great players and I'm very fortunate to, to know them. So, yeah, definitely still taking them. Uh, kind of on that, you mentioned that you're not playing anymore. According to Transfermarkt, you have signed for a team, but there haven't been any appearances. Is that, I mean, you're giving me hope if that's the truth, because, uh, you know, let, so what's going on there? No, that was something that happened um, last year. I'd been, I'd been retired two years, two and a half years, I think, um, but I was obviously still fit. I love my fitness, and I kind of had, I kind of had the itch. I wondered whether I could come back. Um, and I've got a friend at a non-league team who's manager, um, and I just mentioned him, "Look, can I come in and train?" He said, "Look, come in and train. Let's have a look at you." Went in and trained. Loved it again. He asked me to sign, so I signed. But the week I signed, then COVID happened. So you know, finished that, um, and then obviously looked at it again and thought, "You know what?" No not for me anymore um let the younger generation play um but no i enjoyed i must admit i enjoyed going back into a club and training and, and being around the players because as a former player that's the one thing i really miss i don't necessarily miss the match days and i miss the buzz of winning i really do you can't replicate that feeling of when you win you're playing in a team celebrating with the fans you can't replicate that that's such a high that's that's the biggest drug in the world um, but also with that became, became the pressure and the expectation. So I missed the training. I missed being around the, the players, and I enjoyed doing that again. But no, it's just uh, definitely time to move on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, can I just ask one more time, uh, going back to your time at, at Leicester City, because you did get that chance to to kind of, you had to put in a, a couple more steps to to get Leicester City up to the Premier League, but then you got that experience. And I guess it was at West Southampton, and and. I've heard you on other interviews, one of them on, on Under the Lights, and you said you kind of wish that would have been able to happen at Southampton. But when you finally got there, I mean, sometimes I think we think of things as a, as a destination. Then we get there, and then it's kind of like you either go, okay, I'm done, or what's next? So when you got there, what, how, did that, how did you take that, and what did that feel like? No, it's, a, it's a brilliant question. I've spoke about this before, and... Um... It was an amazing feeling. First of all, it was an amazing feeling to actually get to the Premier League and play in the Premier League. I actually think it suited my game more, the, 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 the Premier League, um, for the player I was. I felt very comfortable at that level. But again, I had to push myself to, to the limit, my body to the limit, to be able to play at that standard. And my body just couldn't cope with it. So I had a lot of injuries that season um, and then obviously moved on. Um, but it's... The question you asked is really interesting because it was kind of the beginning of the end for me. I'd taken that long to get to the Premier League. I think I was 32 when I made my debut in the Premier League. Um, and once I got there, um, I didn't set new goals. I didn't set new targets. And that was the downfall for me. It was kind of like, okay, what do I go? What am I going to do next? What is my drive? What is my vision every day? What is my passion? What is my focus every day to train hard, to be disciplined? sacrifice things and I didn't put a new target in place and that really affected me so I didn't set any new goals and my career kind of drifted from then you know from from making my debut in the Premier League I was out of football within two years which is crazy to, to think that um, so mentally it had a real real effect on me um, and I wish that is one thing in my career I wish I could go back and change that from that moment when I'd made my debut in the Premier League that sets the new goals now what can I do what can I achieve now um, so very grateful that I got the chance to play in the Premier League but yeah it was the beginning of the end for me and, and, that, and that's disappointing you've also mentioned um, you know you're not really looking to go into coaching right now based on on your family and kind of your your goals with and around your family and raising your kids and stuff and you know I, I've mentioned several times I didn't get to watch you play but um, following along on your fitness platform Dean Hammond Fitness uh, following on Instagram and I knew you were a Saints, a former Saints player. I knew you were a former Saints captain, um, but I didn't really know anything else. And and watching that and being a, a father of kids who I want to be physically fit 
four and, and who also, I want my kids to be physically fit and, um, you know, have drive and determination and push through barriers and things like that. And your kind of whole mentality around that really drew me in. And, um, if I'm honest, that's really what I, this is all a ruse just to be able to ask you questions about this. So, um, <laughs> can you, can you give me the story, uh, behind Dean Hammond fitness and, and what, what, what prompted you to, to go ahead and make that push? Uh, you know, given everything else that's happening and, and the fact that you are still working in football, even if you're not coaching? It's something I'm very, very passionate about. It's, I, I love my fitness. I think it, fitness is such a, has such a huge benefit on your life. Now, I'm not talking about we all need to be bodybuilders and, you know, have this 12 pack and um, look like an amazing model and things like that. It's more the feeling it can give you, the, the mood raiser it can give you, the purpose it gives you, the structure it gives you. And when I finished playing football, I had two years of, it was ch of challenges. It was difficult in my life, and I really needed some structure um, around my life again. And I, I found that in, in, in exercise. I found that in fitness. And I wanted to pass that on. I'm very passionate about being a father. I love being a dad. The challenges, there's ups and downs, like we all know. Um, but I, I love being a father. And if I can, a bit like being a captain when I've been at a football team, you know, if I can lead by example and I can demonstrate to my children that exercise, fitness, well-being can really improve your life and can really help you reach your dreams and reach your goals, then I need to show, um, I need to demonstrate that to them. So I really enjoy helping others and I feel as though I can do that through the platform. You know, it's four times a week, it's 30 minutes, it's, it's a real time saver, it's a high intensity workout. You can get everything you need in, in within the 30 minutes. And I love doing it in the morning. I do it in the morning because it sets your day up. It builds that foundation of the day. And within the workout, all I try and encourage or ask of my members is to do their best. Now, that's different for everyone. I have lots of different members and different types of members. But do your best. Can you do one more rep? Can you work for an extra 10 seconds each day? And just build that resilience. And I, I love doing it. And that is why... Um, created the platform and that's why I'll keep developing you know there's new things that are behind the scenes that are going to come in soon which I'll explain through social media which are going to are going to help even more which will give a more personal touch with myself um will there'll be some well-being there's some new mentoring there'll be some introduced in terms of football um so I'm really excited about it but that's the reason why it started to give structure around what I do and try and pass on the message of a beneficial exercise from me and you know, you are a father now and your kids are, are, are getting to the age where they're going to be heavily involved in, in other things. And I mean, has that having young children as you were getting into, you know, the later, the later part of your career, did that change your focus at all? Was that kind of one of the decisions like, hey, maybe this isn't uh, maybe I don't need to keep playing. Maybe I need to, you know, now shift things a little bit. Is it, was that was that part of it? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. My, my, my children always gave me focus. Um, but obviously there was the added pressure because as, as a father you have to support them, you have to provide for them. Um, so that was, I think it didn't put a burden on me. Um, I love the fact that my children were excited because I was a professional footballer. As a family they would come to the games and, and support me. Unfortunately my youngest son never saw me play because <laughs> the, day, the day he was born, the next day was my actual last professional game. Um, so he never saw me play. Um, but the other, my, my, the other two children did. Um, but no, I, they, they didn't have a, it didn't have a factor of thinking, right, I, I need to finish playing football now because I want to spend more time with my children. I did make the decision when, um, take six months out of the game, thinking I would go back into it and never got that opportunity or never did go back into it. Um, but it was more, as you get older, you'll know as a father, as you get older, you, you your decisions, you consider it more. How is this going to affect my family? How is this going to affect my children? Am I doing the right thing? And that can be really difficult. It really can because when you're 19, 20, 21, you just make decisions because you're passionate about something. Is it going to work out? I don't really care. I'm just going to go for something because if I fail, I'm only, I've only got myself to rely on. When you've got other people relying on you, it changes your thought process. Not in a bad way, but it, it definitely changes your thought process. I, I can say that, you know, I, when I hit 30, um, my body seemed to just kind of start to crumble a little bit and um, I was pretty unhappy. And you talked about a period of a couple of years after you stopped playing where things were difficult. 
And I know that that period in my life, like when I was, was talking to the doctors and things, they, one of the doctors finally just sat me down and said, look, you need to go out and, and, and be, you need to do something physical once a week. You need to have a release. And so he's like, look, if you can go play football, go play football. And you tell your kind of wife, like this has to happen. And some of the stuff that you, you post on Instagram, the, around like the, the good that exercise and, and even some competition can do for your mental health. Um, is that something that that's been new to you as you, as you've gotten a little bit older or was that kind of a, uh, was that, was that always there when you were, when you were playing as well? Well, I've only realized it since I finished playing because obviously when you're a professional footballer, your job is to exercise um, and, and to be fit and to be healthy because that is part of the, of your career. Um, so I didn't appreciate it, but when I came out of football and I finished and, I had to self-manage myself to, to keep myself physically fit and healthy and, and still make good decisions. But, I, you know, when you're a footballer and it's your career, you make the decisions because you want to put the best performance in you can and be the best player you can. So then decisions are easy to make. When you have less responsibility in terms of your career and your fitness, you, you make different choices. So that was my challenge. That really was my challenge in, in them two years to keep motivating myself to exercise and I became a different person really and a person that I didn't want to be and it took it took a while to realize that what was missing from my life and like you said there Matt exercise is, is so important and exercise is different for everyone it can be your exercise can be walking your exercise can be playing in a team sport it could be anything it's it's associating with like-minded people it's getting your heart raised it's building a bit of resilience, can I keep pushing myself, can I keep improving myself, because that builds confidence in yourself, and it builds trust in yourself again, I lost, I lost trust in myself for a while, and confidence in myself, now getting myself physically fit again, um, having structure in my life around exercise, I can honestly say it's improved every part of my life again, my relationship with my family, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my friends, my decision making, why I'm making decisions because I'm exercising, I feel better about myself and my picture, my vision is clearer and I'm just, I feel as though that's come from real life experiences. So the challenges I had, I wouldn't change that now at all because it's made me realize and appreciate what I need to do in my life. I appreciate you being willing to share that. Um, I think sometimes it, the people need to hear it um, and it's hard to, because I know when I was going through it and, and, um, you know, I was raised by a guy who was raised by somebody who was in World War II. So it was like, you know, you just kind of get on with it and you don't complain and, and that. And so be, being raised that way was kind of, you know, you just kind of deal with it and keep going. And um, sometimes it, it you just have to say it out loud and, and come to the realization yourself that sometimes you have friends or, or doctors, whoever there, that are there to help. And, and then you have to make the, the kind of hard decisions to, to keep going and make the changes, which I think is, is important. And you've done it, obviously. Um, and you, and you kind of refound that. So I think it's, uh, that's one of the things that stands out and I don't know if you mean for it to stand out, but at least when I look at the, uh, when I look at, at your social media posts and I watch the, the Instagram stories and stuff like that, I, that, that's something that jumps out to me. Um, but Leon, we have some listener questions and I'm sure you have some follow-up questions for Dean. Uh, I've got one here. A good, one. A good question actually, Dean, from Ryan Thron. Um, I know Ryan from the St. Mary's, um, We've been out there a couple of times, putting the flag out before kickoff, so I know Ryan. And his question to you is, um, what was your favourite game for Southampton Football Club? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, I would have to say there's lots. There, there is. There's obviously lots. I'm very, very proud of making my debut. You know, making my debut for the club and putting the shirt on for the first time and walking out of St Mary's was, was, was great. Um, my first game as captain. Um, which was fantastic as well. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about favourite games, the promotions were brilliant, scoring goals were brilliant. But just because of the occasion, I'd have to say the win at Wembley. Even though our performance wasn't brilliant, we won 4-1. Um, I didn't play particularly great that day, but we didn't need to. Um, but just seeing, playing at Wembley, I, I, I had to kind of pinch myself at the time. I'm playing at Wembley, for Southampton, I'm captain, I'm going to walk up these famous steps and I'm going to lift the trophy at Wembley for Southampton in front of 50,000, 60,000 red and white scarves, shirts, 
flags. You know, I don't think you can get a better day for that. And did I ever really think that was going to happen? Probably not, and it did. Um, so even now, looking back on it, I can still, I can still feel the feeling. Um, so I think that was my most memorable game. I've got a, a, a question that uh, can follow on from that, um, Dean. A um, uh, question from Matt Hill. Um, what, how do you celebrate winning that day? What, what, what happened after the game? Where did you go? <laughs> um, well, we obviously celebrated in, in the dressing room. Um, it, was, it was interesting because we were aware that we had, we had a game in a couple of days' time against Brighton. So, obviously, we were trying to get into the playoffs. So, we were aware of that. But... We're also aware, um, Alan Pardew was very good at this. He wanted you to celebrate success because he was like, well, if we can't celebrate success, why are we doing it? So we went in the dressing room. We obviously had a few drinks. That was brilliant. We got a bus back. We actually made the, we actually well, made, we requested that the bus stop at a, um, an off license. That we, so we stopped <laughs> in London and nowhere, got some beers for the bus, had a good few drinks. Um, and then we met for, we met for a meal back in, in Southampton and celebrated with our families. We had an evening out as well. Um, and I can remember waking up the next day with um, a smile on my face, but uh, <laughs> a headache as well. So it was, um, it was an enjoyable celebration. And I think two days later, I think we, three days later, we drew with Brian too. All. So it, was, it worked out pretty well. I, I assume they didn't <laughs> have a 11 a.m. training the next day, though. No, we weren't, we weren't in training the next day, which was nice, because I don't think any of us could have got to training, let alone train. So, um, no, it was brilliant times, and you've got to celebrate them. You know, you don't know when they're going to come around again. I think in life, in football, anything, if you, you've got to learn to celebrate the success and not worry about what's happening tomorrow. Live in the moment at times. Not every day. If you achieve something and you've dedicated yourself and worked hard enough, why not enjoy it? So, we, we definitely enjoyed ourselves that night. Talk about um, Alan Pardew. We've got another question from Marcus Holbrook here. Um, and you're going to have a different answer to um, the manager that's going to talk about. He just asked, um, what was the best manager you played under? At Southampton or in my career? Um, in your career, Dean, yeah. Um, but I, I wouldn't be doing Justin without, without uh, mentioning most of them. You know, Mickey Adams was a Southampton player when I was... Um, uh, YTS at Brighton. He was a manager at Brighton. He was great. Um, taught me how to be a man, really. Um, you know, coming from school, he was really, really good. Really enjoyed working under Dean Wilkins as well. Uh, Mark McGee was at Brighton and, and gave him my real consistent opportunity in the first team, really. Dean Wilkins made me captain at 21 at Brighton. Um, and then worked under, obviously, Allen was, was very, very good. Um, you know, um, Nigel Atkins was good, worked under Gus Poyer, but the best manager I feel as though I worked on, and if you're saying manager, who managed the football club, who managed the players, I'd have to say Nigel Pearson. Nigel Pearson at Leicester, you know, ex-Southampton manager as well, only for a short period, he was fantastic. You know, his man management skills were amazing. Very, he had a presence about him, um, but a good presence. It wasn't out of fear. He had authority. And when he spoke, he listened, but because when he spoke and what he said made real sense. Um, so I really, really enjoyed my time after then. Remained in contact with him since I finished playing. Um, and just, he's a great person. And um, I think he's the best manager I worked under. And he's had a fantastic career as a manager. And, you know, he's had his ups and downs with different things. But as a manager, he's brilliant. I've got a personal uh, last question for myself, um, Dean, a um, bit of a toughie. Brighton or Southampton? That's, a, that's rude. <laughs> yeah, Southampton. <laughs> I'm, a Bright, I'm a Brighton. I was born in, in Sussex. Um, I watched Brighton when I grew up. I made my debut at Brighton. I owe Brighton a lot. I really do. And I love playing for the club and being captain and having success there. But um, I think coming to Southampton, playing for Southampton, um, really made me as a as a player and as a person. I think my career really started when I got to Southampton um, and my success really started. So um, it's made me the person I am today. Um, so I'd always say Southampton. Got a, a couple more things. One just comment from Lee Cook says, absolute gem for us, no question as such. Just let him know that 
he was such an important player and part of our history and a, and a top, top player. So that comes from Lee. Uh, that's got more likes than any of the other posts uh, on the thing. So I think a lot of people feel that way and just we want to pass it on to you. Um, Matt Hill, along the same lines, just says, uh, you know, you had some great times with Saints as well as various other clubs, and now you're, you're back uh, working at Saints. And um, you're using terms like we and us. Um, and he, he says... I'd like to know what it is about the club that kept you linked with us even after you you left and you obviously grew up, you know, near near Brighton. Um and and, and do you now I guess consider yourself a, a Saints supporter in, in some respect? I would definitely consider myself as a as a Saints supporter. Yeah. It's the club that I would follow most. Um the one thing that attracts me back to the football club is the people. The people at the football club. So that's what makes the football club, I believe. Um the time I had there, the memories I have, and um, like I just mentioned before, I think it really made me as a player and as a person, um, and I just loved my time there. So when I got offered the opportunity to come back and work at the football club a little bit when I signed for it, I just didn't hesitate because the show I do now is fantastic. I love it. I honestly love it. And it's, again, it's because of the people I work with at Southampton. They make the show. They make it so easy and so enjoyable. I just love it. And that is what the club's like. You know, I lived in Hampshire for four years with my family. We love that as well. Um, if I'm honest, we probably should have never left. But um, I love I love living in Hampshire, living in a new forest. So it's just, there's just a vibe around the football club that's brilliant. And I love the way they do something. The, um, the values at the club is kind of what, I kind of see in myself and I think that's come from them. So they've developed me in that manner. And it's something I want to pass on to my family. So um no, brilliant, brilliant football. Matthew Bishop says, what was your best and you and worst? You kind of mentioned that you know, the JPT final you didn't exactly play well. Um, but do you have a game that you feel you perform best, or maybe that's just a favorite, and then maybe one that you feel like, you know, maybe if you could go back and redo it, you would you would do it over again. Yeah, definitely. Um, best performance? I don't know what my best performance is. My most, I suppose, enjoyable moment would have probably been, obviously, apart from the promotions and that, and then the Saints trophy would have been um, the goal was scored against Leeds. Um, that moment of, of, you know, celebrating in front of the fans, um, scoring the first goal and our return to the championship, celebrating with the players um, as captain, I'll remember that that moment um, in, my, in my career, my Southampton career. And the worst moment I would, I would honestly say would be the championship season when we played Reading at home um, and they were chasing us for the title. We knew we had to win. We just equalised or it was one or I think Ricky had just equalised. We knew if we could win the game, we would, we would win the league. And I gave the ball away in the centre and midfield actually. Um, there was four or five passes after the goal had scored, but I'd always kind of blame myself for that, for that moment. Not saying we lost the game for that, if you're asking for me for my worst moment or most memorable moment that I've done or negative moment, I would say that. That's always stayed in my memory thinking if I could just, if I try to have a touch when I should have played it first time. But, you know, that's football. That's life. I, you know, we still got promoted. So it's not too bad. Um, but that I'll probably say that's my worst moment. Um, I, I have two more things, I think. And um, one of them is, goes back to you being captain of the club and, and obviously there's a lot of responsibility there. And, and you talked about Nigel coming to you and, and, and letting you know that you wouldn't be captain anymore. Um, and when you came into the club, you had been captain previously. Uh, Kelvin Davis was obviously uh, around and was the captain at the time. And there was an agreement that was come to uh, where he would be club captain and you would be, you would wear the armband was his you know, I don't know how he took that, but was his reaction to that kind of a, uh, I guess, any sort of a, a, a kind of a, a, did it have any influence on you in terms of the way you reacted when, when your time came to, to hand that over? Or, um, you know, were you, I, I think you're slightly different people based on, I've never seen you in the costume that he was running around in there a couple of times, but, uh, you know, uh, how did, how did that work out for you? What was that kind of interaction like? Um, when, you know, I was given, it was a bit of a surprise when I was, I was my captain. It was, um, we were both called into um, Alan's office um, and he talked to us both at the same time and, and just explained what was going to happen and I didn't hesitate to take the armband and Kelvin took it pretty well and was very supportive of me. Um, you know, you'd have to ask him personally how he felt 
Um, he was probably disappointed. I know I, I was when I lost the, the captaincy, but he didn't he didn't lose the captaincy because he was he was captain of the football club. He was just losing wearing the armband really. So he still had that responsibility. He still had that presence. He had the personality within the dressing room. He led the team and and um, and the group really. I just got the honour of wearing the armband, um, but. You know, it was difficult to start with when I was captain because I had to prove myself all over again. When you come into a football club, you have to prove yourself as a player. You have to prove yourself as a, as a, as a person. And then fresh early on, again, I'm having to prove myself as, am I worthy enough to wear the armband? Am I good enough to be captain to the players, let alone the fans or anyone else yet? I've got to prove to this group of players that they're going to trust me to lead them out. Um, so it was, it was tough. And when I had to give the armband up, you know, I, I tried to react in the same way as Kelvin and I spoke to Adam Lallana and said, look, um, you're going to be a brilliant captain. Uh, you're a fantastic player. Um, and, you know, if someone's going to have the armband off me, I'm, I'm glad it was him because um, he ended up being a, a brilliant captain for the club and he's a great person, great player. So it's tough. I'm not going to lie. It's really, really tough. And I'm sure Kelvin set the down the same, well, same way. Um, but no, he was good. He was good with me. And then... We haven't talked about Saints a lot, uh, current form and things like that, and that that's okay because it's not uh, we're not focused on that today. But looking at, at James Ward-Prowse being the captain now, um, you got to see him and play with him when he was very young, breaking into the first team. Did I mean I don't want to say did you see him developing into this? But I would say as a as a Saints fan, there's been a lot of criticism of him early on for maybe being um, you know maybe not hard enough if that's a, even a probably not a great term to use, but. Um, you know, could he handle himself in the center of midfield? We couldn't find a position for him under under previous managers. And now he has that armband and you having played in central midfield. I mean, what did, I guess, what did, what did you see in him and, and how have you seen his, his progression up to this point? And I promise not to ask you about uh, any current players other than that. No, um, uh, obviously Krause, when he came and trained with us at, at 16, you could see his talent. Um, the club had obviously seen his talent. Um, his dedication as well. He'd always worked very, very hard. He was a good listener. He wanted to learn, so he would speak to the, the more experienced players. He would listen to the coaches. He would always um, put his maximum effort into training when he trained with the first team. Um, but I always saw him as a centre midfield player because he was technically good. He's aware, like Leon mentioned, his awareness is very, very good. He scans and um, he knows what he's going to do with the ball. Um, and he got put wide as, as a wide player because his delivery is so good. You know, I'm not comparing him to David Beckham, but he has got such a good delivery on, on set pieces and crosses that he could definitely influence the game from a wide position. I remember as a youngster myself, you start wide before you can earn the manager's trust. Because once you come into the core of the team and the central of the team, uh, your, your goalkeeper, your centre half, your midfield, your centre midfield players, and your strikers, it's the most important area of the pitch. The manager needs to trust you. And he's obviously, he's learned that uh, the trust of the current manager. And if you sat down and, and spoke to Prousey, I'm sure he would say the same as me. When you get that armband, you feel that extra responsibility and it's made him a better player, 100%. He will feel comfortable within the team now. He feels as though he, he uh, will be able to lead the team and it's improved his performances. It really has. And watching him this season and the back end of last season, he's been amazing. He really has. And he's turning into the player that I think we all saw him as a youngster. And he's still young now. I, I mean, what's Prowse? 25, 26, is he something like that? Not even that, maybe. So he's got, you know, a lot of years ahead of him. And um, rightly so, he's captain of the football club and he's influencing games and um, you know, long may it continue. Because he's, he, again, Southampton seem to do this. They seem to produce good players as well for the academy. And he's another good person. You have also, we talked about Dean Hammond Elite Fitness a little bit, and I just want to finish off by uh, talking about bringing it up one more time. Um, people can follow you on all the social media channels. You're at Dean Hammond Elite Fitness. You're also on, on Instagram as, as yourself, is just Dean J. Hammond. Um, there's also DeanHammondElite.com. And just if people show up to that and, and are all, at all interested, or maybe they're a little hesitant because you are a, a professional athlete and, you know, we're not. Um, what would you, what, what can people expect when they show up? Um, you know, I, uh, I'll just use myself as an example. I'm like, oh, well, I live on the West coast of the United States. So obviously 7.30 AM is not going to work for me. Uh, how have you kind of gone about uh, kind of taking away the excuses that, that we could use to, to, to not get in shape? 
Well, it, it definitely works for everyone worldwide. So I do them personally 7.30 in, in the morning. But once I finish the live session, they're recorded and they upload to the platform. So they stay recorded and anyone can do them anytime they want. They stay on the platform. There's 10, 15 workouts on there. Um, and they can be uh, convenient to, to anyone at, at any point. So you don't have to do it live. More people actually do it via catch-up. Um, but yeah, I mean, if anyone's got any questions or anyone wants to discuss it with me, send me a message. I'm more happy, I'm more than happy to discuss it with them. I'll jump on a Zoom call with, with people. I've done that before. I'm really, really passionate about helping people and, and passing on my knowledge, passing on my experiences of, of good and bad. Um, and it's, it's four workouts um, a week. You don't have to do them all. They last 30, 35 minutes. They're high intensity. So then you're finished for the day. You've got your exercise. Um, you've built that foundation, and it's, it's a lot of like-minded people. And like I said, the additions we're adding to the platform all the time in terms of there's going to be a private members um, page on Facebook where I'm going to be doing live chat. I'm going to be putting my experience on there of football, of nutrition, of fitness, um, all different things um, to help people. I'm going to be doing it with someone else, and we're going to discuss well-being, mental health, um, which I've been doing live on Instagram anyway, but we're going to move it to um, the exclusive members page. So there's lots to do, and I'm trying to just build this, this full package that really helped me get to find myself again and put me in a position where I want to set goals again for my life. I want to achieve things again in my life. So that's the idea of the platform. So if anyone's got any, any questions and they they feel that they're intimidated, there's no reason to be. I think I'm, a, I'm a, an approachable guy. Just send me a message. We'll get on a chat and we'll have a, a conversation. I, I can attest to that. You are extremely approachable. You were um, more than generous with your time uh, for Leon and I today. And, and I know I appreciate it. And I know uh, all the Saints Archive members will appreciate it as well. And, um, you know, usually I'm super nervous before I talk to anybody. And you made me I don't, as comfortable as possible. So I, I just want to say thanks for that. Um, Leon, do you have anything else that you want to add before we kind of wrap this up? Yeah, I just say, um, Dean, thanks for that fantastic journey from League One to the Premiership. I didn't ever forget it either. So, um, and it's been a, a real privilege to talk to you today as well. Oh, thank you. It's been, it's been brilliant, guys. I've really enjoyed it myself. All right. So once again, if anybody wants to follow uh, Dean on Instagram or social media, it's at Dean Hammond Elite Fitness. And the platform website is in the show notes at DeanHammondElite.com. Uh, Dean, I just want to say thank you again uh, for everything. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and uh, best of luck to you and your family. Stay uh, healthy and well. And, um, you know, hopefully maybe one day we'll, we'll do this again. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Really enjoyable. And that does it for this week's episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Special thanks this week goes out to Dean Hammond and to Will and Leon of the Saints Archive. Thank you all so much for your time and your work, um, not just on this show, but in everything else that you do to make sure that Saints fans get access to the club and the history and the analysis that uh, I think we're all looking for. Obviously, you are listening to the show after the Christmas holiday, but no matter what you are celebrating, I hope that you are safe and well. I want to thank you for taking some time to join us uh, and listen to, to Dean and his story. If you'd like to follow Dean Hammond or Dean Hammond Elite Fitness, all of the links are in the show notes, as well as the link to Dean's website, Dean Hammond Elite Fitness. So you can get all of that by clicking down in the show notes. And if you want to become a member of the Saints Archive, you can do that as well. All of the links are down below. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to hear more in the future, please be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have suggestions for future guests, somebody you'd like to hear from, drop us a comment and let us know, and we'll do our best to get them on in the future. If you're listening on an app that allows you to rate and review, please consider doing that. It does help spread the show to a wider audience, and we would very much appreciate it. All music for the show comes courtesy of the Free Music Archive at freemusicarchive.org. The intro song is Epic Song by Boxcat Games, and the end of show credits that you listen to now is Aim is True by Pottington Bear. Saints Archive, along with the Southampton page, are the official partners of the show, and Matt Beeling of the We Are Southampton page on Instagram does the logo for the show. If you'd like to get in touch with them, 
All links, as I said before, are in the show notes. I want to say again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your time. Thank you to Dean Hammond. And we will be back next week. And until then, remember that together, we march on. Is that all right, Will, or do you want to add anything in there? No, no, I'm cool with that.